Um, I would like to call to order the April 18th meeting of the Village Cold Springs Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm Aaron Wolf, I'm the chair, and we also have tonight Eric Worth, Donald McDonald, John Martin, and Grace Lowe, our other board members. Um, and we've got our board secretary, Michael Mell, and tonight we have our village attorney, um, John First, uh, who's going to assist us with the public hearing for 21 Parsonage Street. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the zoning board, we have two main roles in the village. Uh, we grant or deny variances to the code when requested by property owners. Um, that's the bulk of our work. And the zoning board is also authorized to interpret the village zoning code if there's a subjective difference of opinion about the code between the department and property owner, and we almost never do that. And we're not doing that tonight. Um, so on tonight's agenda, we have three things. We've got a uh, public hearing for 21 Parsonage Street um, for several variances required to permit construction of a single family home in the R1 district. We have a public hearing for 3 Rock Street for a variance to the minimum dwelling size in the R3 district. And we have a workshop for 3 Furnace Street for an application for a variance to the maximum fence height in the R1 district. Um, I think I had three Rock Street first on the um, the agenda, but uh, I think it would be a good idea to handle 21 Parsonage first if the board is okay with that. It's fine. Mm -hmm. And do any of the applicants have any um, any concerns about that change? No objection. Okay. Um, So uh, let's start with then the, the 21 Parsonage Street public hearing. And I want to start by explaining um, how the public hearing is going to work and what our order of operations um, is for tonight. So we're not going to make a decision on the application tonight. And the primary reason is because we need to wait for the county to acknowledge that they have been notified and that they don't have an interest in the application. or for 30 days to pass since they were notified on April 9th. This is a state code requirement um, because of the property's location near um, County Highway 301. Um, so if the county does not acknowledge, then we are required to wait for 30 days, which makes the earliest voting date for this on May, our meeting at May 16th. Um, so a couple other things that have, that have come up during our past workshops. I think we've had two workshops for this um, project already. Um, I want to point out that during discussion, um, it might seem like board or the board or individual members are looking for ways to support or reject the project. And I want to make clear that that's an assumption that you probably don't want to make. What we're doing is building our understanding of the project um, and the application and public opinion on that. So keep that in mind, please. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to explain uh, the rest of the way the discussion is going to flow, and then we're going to start. So we're going to double check that the application is complete and that notifications have been sent to the neighbors and the sign has been up. Um, then I would like for the ZBA to have a discussion about the legal status of the lot for zoning purposes so that we're all clear on the circumstances that bring the applicant here tonight and how um, how the, uh, the code applies to, to this, um, this lot. Um, next, we're going to open the public hearing. The applicant is going to present the application to the board and the public. Um, once the presentation is complete, the board will address questions to the applicant. And um, then after that, we'll open the public comment period, and the public um, will be able to comment in an organized way so that everybody can hear the answers and everyone has a chance to uh, to get their questions out. Depending on how long this goes, we might not get to everybody tonight, but keep in mind that this is going to be open for uh, at least two more meetings, so there's going to be plenty of time for uh, in-person comment and for written, written comment to the board. Um, let's see, and it is also uh, possible that the ZBA will hold a closed meeting with our village attorney either tonight after um, this portion of the meeting or at another date to uh, discuss legal matters. It's not going to be a session where we are receiving new evidence 
we're hearing witnesses and we won't be making any decisions if we do that during those meetings. It will just be um, clear, getting clarification about the legal concerns um, for the application. Okay, so everybody, anybody have any questions about that on the board before we jump in with suggestions? No. Okay, great. So, um, we want to start with um, the uh, the legal the legal status of um, the lot for zoning purposes. It's a little bit confusing. Um, um, before I get into that, I want to um, review the responses that we received from the HDRB, the Historic Review Board, and from the Planning Board. At our last workshop, we asked them to uh, make comment on the um, application, and our, our general interest was to make sure that we would not, um, should we grant any variances, set up a um, situation that could not um, could not be handled by either of those two boards. So um, the HDRB told us they have not received an application for this project. They did have one workshop on it. They made no findings or conclusions. Um, I think there was a statement at our last workshop that the HDRB had saw it, had seen no historic value in the barn, but Al Zigolinski, the chair of the board, says that that statement is incorrect and that they have not yet formed any opinion at all on the historic value of the barn. Um, they declined to offer an opinion on that and whether the barn itself has historic, historic value and also whether the location of the barn has any historic importance. So basically we're at zero with the HDRB. Um, he did, of course, mention that it's in the local historic district and that it, as such, it's subject to a high bar for demolition and modification. Um, I have a good question. Sure. Do they have a timetable for making some determinations about that or recommendation? Well, I think they're waiting for to see what happens here, okay. and then they would start their regular process. Okay. Um, but they have not received a, a complete application yet. Um, so while it might seem to be a foregone conclusion that the old rickety barn is going to go away quickly, that's completely up to the HDRB and they haven't started that process yet. Um, we also requested an opinion from planning and uh, in an email from the chair, Matt Francisco, who's here, um, he um, informed the board, the ZBA, that uh, um, they will be essentially not providing an opinion to us because uh, first they only had three people there and the two of the board members um, felt strongly that they did not want to infer um, support or approval of the application or any board alignment. Um, uh, Matt also uh, pointed out that there was a a previous informal review um, where the applicant uh, attended and there was, uh, I don't know, a consensus or an idea that reducing the nonconformity of, of the project um, would be desired from the planning board's point of view. Um, I, I watched the meeting where the planning board um, decided not to reply, and I want to make a couple of comments about that. First, I wanted to clear up um, a misunderstanding. Um, it was stated a couple of times in that meeting that we did not have a complete application when we referred it to the planning board for this review. We do have a complete application, and I think the confusion that came about from that is that um, there was no narrative attached to the application about the five factors that the ZBA considers when we're granting area variances. Now, we review the area, we review the five factors at our public hearings. Some applicants come with a completely drawn out narrative, others do not. They come with something or more frequently nothing. Um, but we always review them all at the meeting and we don't really consider that um, necessary to have in hand before we schedule a public hearing. So that is um, 
that is why it might have seemed that, that we didn't have a complete application. Um, there were a couple of other things there that I wanted to comment on. Um, there was a, a concern that by granting variances, this would be a legislative action. There's been some discussion um, with our village attorney who says that this is not a legislative action. The board is, you know, we're welcome to discuss that if we want um, when we get into it. Um, there were also a couple of suggestions that one was that if, if variances were to be granted, that um, restriction be placed so that the property could not be enlarged in the future and no extra accessory structures um, could be added. And additionally, that uh, there was another comment that the neighbors have enjoyed the assurance of the merger. And what that means is, we'll get into in a little bit, but it has to do with the way these two non-conforming lots came to be um, mer technically merged for zoning purposes. And I, th I think that's one way to look at why it's not, why the lot does not yet have a structure on it. Um, the other one is that nobody has ever applied for variances before for building on this lot as far as we've been able to determine. Okay, this is far more, far much more talking than I normally do at these hearings, but it's gonna continue a little bit longer. Um, so a little bit about this application and why it's more complicated than than the normal applications we see. Um, first, we're considering variances to allow a new building on a non-conforming lot. And this lot is non-conforming in, in its size, its dimensions and area. Um, because of that, it's gonna require um, at least the one variance. Um, in addition, the application that we have places the, the, the building in a spot on the lot where it triggers many more variances that, need, that are needed um, in order to, uh, to build a lot. Um, uh, let's see, so the pre-existing non-conforming lot was created prior, to, so this lot, the 21 Parsonage, is a pre-existing non-conforming lot created prior to the adoption of the Village Zoning Code in 1967. And at that time, it was owned, 36 Pine and 21 Parsonage were owned by the same owner. So when the zoning code uh, came into effect in 1967, the lot at 21 Parsonage lost um, any kind of grandfathered status and protections that it had, um, that it would have had if it had been a separate, separate ownership. And this is what um, we're talking about when we say that it's a merged lot. It no longer has, uh, it, it doesn't qualify to be a pre-existing lot anymore. Or a pre-existing, it doesn't get the benefits of being a pre-existing non-conforming lot because it has the same owner. Um, so there, at our last workshop, um, at the planning board reviews of this and in discussion with our village attorney, um, there has been some discussion about the legal status of the lot. And I want to um, lay out where the current and I would imagine um, bind, binding or final understanding is, and that is that the applicant who, is in, who owns the lot is certainly um, apply, you know, allowed to apply for variances that would be required to build on the lot. Um, they are not applying for an interpretation of of the, uh, the merger clause, um, and they are not sta stating that the lot was ever officially subdivided um, at, any, at any time. So we're looking at the variances in order to, to make this buildable. Um, if variances are gra granted, then the lot becomes a conforming lot under the, uh, under the village code. And we can, we can go into that further um, if the board wants to. And I would encourage anybody who has questions that um, we're going that we ask those of John right now, so that we're all, all on the same page with regard to that as we get into the variances. <coughs> um, also, um, another reason why this is complicated is because there are past legal uh, cases against the village that dealt with merge lots, um, and the ZBA certainly wants to understand the implications of our decision. Um, with regard to those, as well as how um, our decision might affect similar properties in the future. And um, as I stated before, we might discuss this in a closed meeting um, with our attorney if we need to. 
Okay, um, does anyone on the board want to go into any of those complications or issues that I've raised with the village attorney? We can, of course, do it later, but I think it would be helpful for us to, to get on the same page um, as we go into the, the public hearing part of the meeting. Well, I guess I'll, I'll um, ask a question. So, just to zero in, not to spend a lot of time, mm -hmm. um, you have you have two lots. Correct. You've got the original lot and the um, the unbuilt the the, build, the the lot with no building on it. Yep. And a lot with no house on. And at some point between, at some point before zoning was enacted. A line was drawn that basically divided the lot. Yes, into two I believe lots. in the 20s. It might have been as long ago as the 1920s. All right, and so now we go come to um, zoning code was enacted in the village, mm -hmm. and uh, the lots were under the same ownership. Correct. Therefore, um, the mer the quote what we call the merger clause um, makes doesn't take the line. It doesn't take the. It doesn't erase the line. It's it doesn't still erase a the line. Lot. There's, it's still the line Under is still. The county hard. records. There's still two tax parcels. So that's the difference between this lot and say, if I have a lot now, and my and I want to take and put a line down the middle of my backyard, and say, oh, I got two lots. Right now, you. The difference you, is that I'm doing it after zoning code was correct. enacted. So you would have to go before the planning board and try to obtain planning board approval. And if it was a, if you were trying to create a substandard lot. The planning board would then have to refer to, to you guys for, for for variances. So back in the twenties, back in the sixties, how they created lots is they just got a map out and said, "These are the lots we want to create," and they just filed the map with the county clerk's office. That's that's how you subdivide a property back then. And there was no planning involved. There was no looking at traffic, noise, aesthetics, community character. It wasn't even a planning board. It wasn't a zoning board of appeals. No. It was just, just a board <laughs> and a mayor. Yes. And probably some money. <laughs> right. And so they just created lots. Yes. And you could make a they lot as big or small as you want. There wasn't any regulations on it. Uh, in Cold Spring, no, there weren't any regulations at that time. Until 1967, when right. zoning came in. Correct. So this the, this clause that we're talking about is one to deal with these lots that came in, that and and it made a distinction between ones that were held separately. Right, so if this lot was held separately at the time in 1968, they, they wouldn't need any variances, or they would need limited variances. They would only need a couple of variances for the setbacks for the structure. But that's not the case. Since it was owned by the same person in 1968, they lose those protections right. uh, because of the, the merger clause. So they don't have the grandfather status. They've never disputed that. Uh, it's, it's, they haven't really raised it as an issue. They, I think they've even acknowledged it was owned by the same person to the 80s. Um, so that's not an issue. The issue is whether this substandard lot is buildable in the sense that will, this, will the board grant the numer numerous variances that are being requested? That's well, really why do we call it a merger clause when there's not the, mer the word merge isn't even in the... Uh, I know. In the, <laughs> That's it's not just, even in the language of the, of the section. I, that's that's just what that's just. I guess people in the business. That's what we we call it. And maybe it's confusing. And maybe I I should have characterized it differently because I think it might have led to some confusion. And I apologize for that. But it, they call it a merger clause because the lots merge for zoning purposes. Even though they're still separate lots, still separate tax lots, they've essentially merged for zoning purposes. So you still have a substandard lot, and they have the right to seek the variances. Now, whether they're granted or not, to make that substandard lot buildable, that's that's up to you guys. You're, you're the lucky ones to figure that out. The confusing part is you say the lots were merged for zoning purposes. So when I think of something merged, I see lot A, lot B, and I see them merged. And right. when I see one lot. Right. That's what I think merge merge right. definition that, is two things merged right. to one. And, and again, maybe so it's a mischaracterization. You say that, and so that's why I keep right. going off so the rails. So let's not use the word merge. Let's just say that this is this is a substandard lot that lost its grandfather protections because it was owned by the same person that owned an adjoining lot. Right. We won't use the M word. So in other words. <laughs> <laughs> So, 
<laughs> In Congress today, they've been not using the F word. So, <laughs> I didn't even know that. Yeah. Um, so, um, um, so, in other words, before and after, you, you have two lots and you still have two lots. Correct. Okay. All right. But All right. the problem is that one lot that they're trying to build on is not buildable. Right. Okay. Unless these variances are granted. Okay. Would it have made a difference if after those two lots were sort of divided back in 1920 where they Mm -hmm. and say they sold to two different individuals. I mean, the one owner at the time sold it to two, and those two individuals then sold it back to a single owner to get both back. Would that have made a difference? Your code is kind of weird because it says at the time of zoning in 1960. So, so that's, you have to that's look, the take a snapshot the of that point. picture yep. and whatever it is. So yep. whatever it was before doesn't matter. Whatever happens after doesn't matter. Right. What, so that what it was like in 1968 and According to all indications, in 1968, it was owned by the same person. And that's what it is. Yep. It, it, it is kind of unique in your code that it says at that time. And it's not just, you know, every, I have a, a lot of municipalities are struggling with this because it seems to be a popular issue with trying to build on substandard lots and pre existing, non conforming substandard lots. I've had this issue come up in two other municipalities in the last couple of months. So, and it's it's a confusing issue. Have you looked at any of the neighboring immediate uh, neighboring lots in that area to see? Some of them are smaller in size, square footage. Uh, yes, I believe the applicant had provided an aerial showing the sizes of some of the the neighboring lots, and maybe he can probably expand upon that during the public hearing for the benefit of the public as well as you guys. So let's remember that question to ask about those other lots and how they got so small and what their status was back in the time the code was set and what it is currently. Yeah. Right, I don't know if the applicant has all that information, but yeah, how they were created, um, my guess is a lot of them were probably pre-existing prior to zoning. It was, a, it was an old village, so. Well, it's something to keep in mind when you talk about the character in the neighborhood. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or discussion? All right, so um, let's uh, let's open our public hearing, and I'm going to start by um, reading a list of variances that we're talking about here, so that everybody knows, um, without reading the entire notice. So um, the application is by Samuel Bro, our applicant, um, for the following variances from requirements set forth in the Village Zoning Code, in order to permit construction of a single-family dwelling on a substandard lot. So first is um, we have a 33,360 three th square foot lot when the code requires a 7,500 square foot lot. The variance to permit one off-street parking spot when two are required. Um, we're allowing it to variance requested to allow uh, a dwelling on a lot with a width of 48 feet when the code requires 75, to allow a lot depth of 70 feet when 75 is required, to permit a front yard setback of 2.2 feet for the dwelling when the code requires 25 feet, to permit one side yard for the proposed dwelling to be 1.5 feet when the code requires 10 feet, and to permit a dwelling on a lot with a 48 by 50 foot square when the code requires at least a 50 foot by 50 foot square. Um, okay, the last one is, might be a little confusing to those not familiar with the zoning code, but it says you have to be able to fit a square that's 50 by 50 on your lot or it's too small. And the point of that is so that all of the narrow lots that we all live in cannot be created anymore. But in this case, um, uh, that is pretty close actually to the, the existing size, so it's only off by two feet. Um, all right, so let's um, open the public hearing and have the applicant come and present the case to us and to the public. So it's, if the public would like to see anything um, that's being uh, discussed or shown to the board, 
um, let us know and we will pass it around. And we might take a break after this section so everybody can come up and look at the materials. Right, and we do have up here um, the site plan as well as some of the aerial, um, which were mentioned briefly. So there are additional copies there. Um, I have a survey and um, some plans that, that we can also provide. So my name is Luke Hilpert. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, Samuel Brown, in order to um, present his application to this board as discussed for uh, the, seven, the seven variances uh, from the Builder's Code. And what we're dealing with here is a um, pre-existing non-conforming lot has been discussed. On the lot, as, as it sits today, there is a barn. That barn has been there, as far as we can tell, from uh, it, it appears on a map from 1912. It's been in that same location. Um, Mr. Bro is attempting to convert that structure into a single family home. Um, oh, right. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. I jumped one of my bullet points, which is to double check that the application is complete and review the, review the mailing yes. list. Excuse and me, also, Adam. Can we ask the applicants to stand next to John so that sure, the sure. video can Welcome show them? Thank you. And also the, um, the affidavit for the uh, sign posted in the letter. Do you guys have one? Not having Thank the affidavit sign. Um, I went by, I mean, I can attest to the sign, but by a couple of times, the sign's there. Right, and I believe because the sign has to be there throughout the whole process, that uh, I would posit that that application, that uh, affidavit can be submitted at the end that has remained through the whole process. It's a continuing, continuing hearing. Mm -hmm. that, um, I'll leave that to John. To the yeah, John, is that... Uh, Work for you. Um, yeah, that's fine. I mean, if, if one of the board members says they saw it up. Um, yeah, I saw it. Um, saw it. Okay. So that's fine. But um, I would actually just submit, submit an affidavit that you posted it. Yes, sir. Um, and then at the end, you can submit an affidavit when you, when you took it down. Okay. You can certainly do that. But you don't have to submit it tonight. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's right. So the sign needs to stay up until we're all done yes. as a hearing sometime in May, probably. Um, all right. You've turned in the um, the uh, receipts, and they were here on this table a moment ago, so they're somewhere buried yeah. under the They are. John's got them. John has them. We're not used to having an attorney here at our hearings. The... Um, the mailings were completed. Additionally, a, um, a notice was hand delivered to the village of uh, Nelsonville, and I believe on an email with you, um, right. Mr. Jeff. Wolf, Jeff did confirm that that the village did receive that. Jeff, the village clerk, spoke to um, the Nelsonville clerk and confirmed that they. I just to make sure that email gets in the record, like in sure. this file, so that way we have it. Okay. Yep. Yeah, um, okay. Great. So, shall we continue? Sure. Okay. So, as I stated, this is uh, the property is located in the R1 district. Um, as you've already gone through, it is a 3,366 uh, 3, square foot lot uh, with a uh, with a 48 feet and a depth of 70 feet. In addition, so that does require the area variance for the entire lot. It requires the uh, the depth and the width variances as well, um, where the uh, depth is required to be 75 feet and the width the same. In addition, because of the uh, the barn that's existing and um, the potential historic value of that barn and or that location, uh, Mr. Bro has, um, through discussions, determined that he would like to uh, use that barn as a footprint to to build the, to convert to a single family home. So based on whatever outcome there is with the historic review board and this board, he would, uh, there is no foundation for that part. So it will have to be lifted. A foundation will have to be provided. It will have to be moved in, in some way, shape or form, but to uh, put it back to that location to uh, try to use it as much as possible would, uh, would be his ideal. 
if that's not possible and the historic review board determines that, then it would be to, uh, to build a new structure in that place. The goal here would be to convert this uh, lot that is vac uh, otherwise vacant from the barn. Um, the barn, as we've talked to the neighbors, um, the lot's untended. The barn is overrun with uh, the skunks seem to find it as a, a fit place to, uh, to inhabit. So there would be uh, a benefit to the neighborhood in um, you know, adding a use to this property. I would like to, to, we talked a bit about the merger provision and Mr. McDonald, I appreciate your question because it went to a lot of what I was uh, going to bring out as well. And um, just mentioning, I'd like to, for the record, uh, read in the, uh, which would be section 134-19L, which states that existing non-conforming lots, a lot in any district that was under separate ownership from all adjoining lots on the effective date of this chapter, in which has a total lot area, lot width, or lot depth less than otherwise required herein, may be used and developed in conformity with all other applicable regulations in its district, subject to grant site plan approval. So that provision, as you pointed out, does not have the word merger in it. So we do have an, a separate lot. It, it does, however, lose, admittedly, lose its non-conforming, its pre-existing non-conforming status, which is why we are here seeking the, vari the area depth and width <coughs> variances. Um, I think it's important to, I think it's important to, re to talk a little bit about the merger and how it comes to be. When you have a provision in a code that's adopted that, uh, that basically prevents an owner of the property from using the property for any benefit, we do have to look at the Fifth Amendment and the takings clause in there. So this issue was presented. Um, there was a, a Supreme Court of the United States case in which um, the state of Wisconsin and the individual Murr, so it's Murr versus Wisconsin, and the, the Supreme Court did say in certain specific circumstances, a merger provision is not deemed to take it. Um, I think it's important though that our Court of Appeals in New York points out that since zoning regulations our derogation of a common law, they must be strictly construed against the municipality which has enacted them, and any ambiguity in the language must be, res must be resolved in favor of the property owner. And also more locally in the second department, um, in Incorporated Village of Oldfield v. Hickey, they state, um, court will not read into zoning ordinances provisions that are not expressly set forth in there. So from that standpoint, I think it, it further um, enforces the fact that this is not merged. It is a, a separate lot, and it does exist in its own. It just does need the variances. Yes. Since you're on that point, if I could just interrupt, interrupt a second. Sure. Is that deemed to be when the code and the law is passed that the person should not have, uh, there shouldn't be a taking of what that person who is currently owning that lot? Whereas in this case, w was the current owner yeah. Uh, applicant before us, did they own the lot at that time, or it was transferred to them subsequently? They took on notice that the lot was non-conforming and I, potentially non-billable. I think there's certainly the fact that um, th there is notice that the, the lot is non-conforming, and I I certainly understand that. Um, would, would those facts change from what that decision? I, I don't think they changed the decision. I think what's important is that uh, the language in this code does not merge the lots. It, and that, that was all I was getting to, and Mr. McDonald actually elicited that um, initially, that the lots are not merged. This is a, this is a, a lot, whether it's um, buildable because it is substandard is up to, you know, that determination is why we're here. But it's a risk when a person buys it. It, 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 it is certainly a risk. That's. That is true. But it's a risk, not because of any merger issue, it's a risk because of the, the amount of variances required to make it into a, to build what they want to build. Well, when, when, there, when there's a lot that is, when there's a lot that is separate, and, and, and then there's a presumption that it is a separate lot to be considered for, uh, for building. You also look at the, you know, at, you know, you look at the rest of the neighborhood and see what is, you know, what the neighborhood looks like in, in how this project would conform with the rest of the neighborhood. Um, so I think what, what makes this property unique is, you know, this has, 
this merger did take place in the 20s, of, or this, I'm sorry, this division, <laughs> the, the merger wasn't until later. Uh, this division did take place in the 20s, and it's been treated at, as separate, and uh, these lots have been treated as separate since that time, for almost 100 years they've been treated as, as separate lots. T separate taxes have been paid on them. Um, it appears, you know, separate and distinct to the public. The neighborhood in which it's located has a lot of similar lots of this size. Um, there is a building on it already. Um, you know, the barn and the lot as it exists today is certainly not a benefit to the uh, to the neighborhood. I think some of the neighbors are here today. I'll let them speak to that more because um, they we did have a meeting with some of the neighbors and they expressed their thoughts and concerns as well. And I know that uh, they certainly will will discuss it more today. Um, so from that standpoint, I think that's the application we're putting forth today to the board. We are requesting the seven variances as stated. So I'd like to kind of just run through the, the variances now. Um, with would, it, the, would it make sense to um, to talk about the building and what the plans are for the lot at this sure. point or after you go through the variances? Uh, whatever you prefer. the board have any preference? Maybe it would help the public understand what we're talking about. Sure. So why don't we do that first? Please? Yeah, and I, I think that is, um, you know, in conversations with the neighbors, that is certainly a, a concern. You know, everybody wants to know what's going to happen here and what's going to be built. So the plans are currently to build a, um, or the plan is to build a, um, or to convert it into a single family residence. It would be a one bedroom house. Um, the structure will stay essentially the same size. It's about 600 square feet. I'm not gonna change the footprint much. And there will be a, um, a parking space off uh, to the side. The rear, the proposal is for the rear of the lot to remain um, uh, in its natural condition with plantings and landscape. Uh, they also discussed the, um, the fact of using some sort of impervious surface for the, uh, for the parking. <coughs> So there won't be any increase uh, in the impervious surface on the, on the property. The intent of the, uh, the homeowner is to have his, he's, he's getting married this spring, and that they will use this house for um, family to visit. Uh, neither one of, neither the homeowner nor his um, fiance's family live locally. Uh, they intend to start a family and to have the parents visit and that the house would ideally be used for that. It, the other option would be a, um, a long-term rental. I know there has been a lot of discussion um, about the possibility of an Airbnb uh, because of, I think, the size. It's, you know, it's not really a family home, and so that's a concern of, uh, I think, of the board and, and the community at large. And um, Mr. Bro has stated that uh, that is not his intended use for the property. Um, and certainly, as you know, the board does have authority to place limits on uh, to prevent such a use. So that is uh, that's the intention with with the property. Uh, that's the intended plan. Um, would you like any more on, on that? Um, I don't know. Maybe a little more description about the building and the Let size of the building and which way it faces yeah. and yeah. Um, the parking and interested in the parking and the deck also. So the, the building will, in as we've designed it, be exactly the same footprint, height, uh, same eaves, same pitch of the roof. Um, it does require a foundation. It does require some windows, um, which are probably the most noticeable feature on the property. Uh, for historic consideration, we have designed it with shutters that close over the windows that face Parsons Street so that when the shutters are closed from the Parsons Street, it looks essentially like it looks right now. A siding would be vertical uh, slats of wood like it has right now. Ideally, we're using as much as we can salvage from the, the current barn. Uh, the entrance would be on the Pine Street side of the building uh, near the back. The only addition to the footprint is a chimney for a fireplace on the first floor. Uh, we're, we've spoken about a metal roof, uh, but that's up for historic uh, consideration as well. We are 
we uh, added a porch, a non-covered porch to the side for the entrance, and beside that a um, gravel parking spot. But it, you know, if you looked at the building right now and essentially added windows and cleaned it up, put a foundation on it, and hooked it up to the water and electricity, that's what we're trying to do. Um, is there anything else you'd like to, uh, to tell us about before we get into our questions? Really? Anything else to present? Uh, I was just going to um, talk through the five factors. Oh, sure. If, yeah, go ahead. If you want to do that or if you'd like to ask questions no, first. You, um, we'd like for you to complete your presentation and then we'll ask questions. Um, sure. So, as we talked about, we are looking for um, seven variances. We, we are talking about a side yard variance, a front yard variance. Uh, variance for one parking spot where uh, two are required, variance in width, width, depth, area, and then the 50 by 50 um, square. So um, basically, you know, we're looking at the project as a whole and um, want to consider the benefit to the, uh, the property owner versus any detriment to the community. And in this instance, I would um, you know, posit that there is a benefit to the community in, in having this property uh, cared for and, and uh, being useful. So for the, um, the side yard variance, the, um, the side yard would be uh, would be one and a half feet where uh, 10 is required. And in looking at that, you know, considering whether there's any sort of undesirable change in the neighborhood, um, or, any, or any undesirable change to the property, that's it is a common uh, occurrence throughout the neighborhood. You can see that uh, 36 Pine Street, right next door, has essentially no side yard. Uh, the property right on the other corner, on uh, actually two of the four properties on that corner on Pine Street, um, are all essentially right on uh, the property lines, or very close there too. Um, on the, I'm sorry, so um, with the 36 Pine, uh, the one on the corner of Pine and Parsonage um, to the south of that, and then over on, uh, on Pine there's another one with uh, virtually no side yard. So the side yard setback um, throughout the neighborhood, there are a lot of narrow lots, there are um, very limited side yard setbacks. Um, so the next question is, is there another means of achieving this? more? Uh, any other means that's feasible for achieving the, the desired uh, outcome. And certainly there are, um, as you, you can see on the drawing, and, and we do have one that you could, you could build this property, or you could knock down this barn and build a, um, a single family house in the middle of the lot where there would be no side yard setback required. Uh, the benefit, in, uh, in our opinion, is that Putting the property at the front, uh, putting the structure at the front of the property where it exists, does have some historic significance, and putting uh, aesthetically and visually, moving the the house into the middle of the property, um, in order to achieve the setback, would actually move it closer to 36 Pine Street, and, uh, yeah, 36 Pine and uh, Mrs. Baltage's property, which is uh, the next one uh, on Parsonage actually sits a little, um, has a wider side yard. So looking at the three properties together from the street, having it on this side yard, uh, closer to this side yard, actually um, is, is vis visually um, and spatially uh, more consistent with the neighborhood. Putting it in the middle would move it much, much closer to 36 Pine and uh, would be more of an encroachment on, on that property. As far as uh, the variance is substantial, yes, this variance is certainly um, from 10 to uh, down to one and a half, essentially, is a, is a substantial variance. But again, we believe that um, the historical aspect and the, uh, the visual with the neighborhood is, uh, does outweigh the, the substantiality of, uh, of that variance. You know, when you're talking about whether it's substantial or not, it's just not a, it's not just a mathematical equation here. It's 
when we're looking at the project as a whole and the community as a whole, is this uh, very substantial in this instance? And so I, I think from that, um, from that standpoint, while it is mathematically substantial, um, there are the limiting factors in that. Um, is there any adverse or physical, um, any adverse environment, physical or environmental uh, change as a result of that? Um, I would say no. You know, this is we're not creating any additional uh, runoff. We're not creating any additional impervious surfaces. So, from an environmental standpoint, a physical standpoint, um, there is no change to the neighborhood. It will have there will be a single family home instead of a barn uh, that's not currently used. So. Um, there is a minimal traffic impact, I, I suppose, but that's, you know, it being a, a one bedroom home, you're looking at a very minimal uh, impact from, from that standpoint as well. And, um, you know, was the, was the self-created? And again, this has been in existence for nearly 100 years in this, this location. We're simply looking to achieve, uh, to convert this into a single family home. Um, so the side yard setback in and of itself is not a, is not a self-created one. Um, because again, the, the, the nature of the building and the way um, we can We can kind of talk about the front yard. I would um, essentially have the same arguments on, on all five factors. Um, when you do look at the, the rest of the neighborhood, um, this property, this front yard being 2.2 feet instead of the 25 feet is again substantial and um, but the rest of the neighborhood there are very few properties that are actually 25 feet set back and I think it would be um, most of the properties do sit far closer to to the street you know I don't know if they're five feet or ten feet but they are far closer not you know not 2.2 but the um, and to be consistent with the neighborhood I think a um, Something far closer than 25 feet is, is certainly um, appropriate and desirable. Um, other, otherwise, yes, of course, there is, uh, as we stated, a, a feasible, another feasible uh, means for achieving this goal. It would be to put the, prop, the house right in the middle of the property. That wouldn't require the, the variances. You know, by doing that, we could eliminate um, eliminate four, three of the, you know, three of the variances by moving the property, uh, I'm sorry, two of the variances by moving the property right to the middle of, of the lot. And um, it's certainly something that if, it, that, that could be done, although we do think that there is a, uh, a historical and aesthetic value to the, uh, to the location of the property. Um, we then have the parking. Again, we have, um, there's no undesirable change in the neighborhood. Is there another feasible means? Yes, we could put a second, um, a second car there, a second parking space there. Um, if we are to meet the other, um, the other requirements, there would be two parking spots right across the, the front of the property, which again would um, not be aesthetically pleasing to, uh, to the neighborhood. You wouldn't be able to do two straight back, I don't believe, without really encroaching on 30, uh, uh, 36 Pine. You, you know, as, as it sits now, the uh, the parking space is about nine feet from uh, from the property. It's six feet from the uh, property line at thirty six Pine, and about nine feet from the uh, from the house. So, to put a second uh, parking spot would you know run the the full length of the house there. But if you had to do two across the front, it would, you'd really encroach on the, on thirty six Pine by meeting the other the other setbacks. Um, and parking is it substantial? There is, you know, we're asking for one instead of two, so it is substantial, uh, you know, somewhat substantial in that sense. But again, this is a one bedroom home. Uh, the intended use will be for the um, data town guests of the applicant, and they would, you know, generally have one rental car uh, for use. So it, there wouldn't be a lot of need for a second parking spot under that circumstance. If it is uh, rented out as a, um, you know, as a long-term rental, then yes, it's, it's feasible that one family would have two, uh, two cars. So, um, but I think the, um, 
the fact that the parking area won't be um, won't be impervious and you know that there's no resulting negative environmental impact on it. So the the width of the lot again, I don't believe there's any undesirable change in the neighborhood because if you look at the um, the overlay that I provided that shows the uh, the properties, you'll see that many uh, a large number of these lots are are uh, narrower than uh, required by the code. And similarly with the depth, a large number of them are uh, are not as deep as the code requires. Um, we can talk about area with that as well, and you'll see I've indicated through. Um, through the multiple listing service, they provide a um, real list which uh, takes all the town codes, tax maps, and puts them, or takes all the town uh, tax information and puts it, uh, makes it available. So these numbers are taken from those tax maps, and when you look at the square footages in the property around, you know this is a 3,300, uh, 3,366 square foot property. Uh, you know. 36 pine is 3770. Uh, the next one over on pine is 3588, 3667. Um, Mrs. Baltage's property is uh, 9133, so that obviously is uh, is above the limit. But uh, that is the only property in the immediate area that is larger than 7,500 square feet. Um, all the other properties are fairly close to. Uh, to the size of this property. So it, it is consistent with, with the neighborhood. <coughs> when we're talking about the, the width, the depth, the width, depth, and area, um, there is no other feasible means to achieve that. This lot is what it is um, without, um, there, you know, without uh, purchasing from Mrs. Baltage and leaving her property, um, somehow conforming, I don't even think that would uh, result in enough in enough um, square footage here anyway. Um, so there is no other feasible means to achieve the goal in that instance. Um, the variances here, again, from a mathematical standpoint, they are substantial. Um, you're talking 50% um, or greater than 50%. But from a, um, a community standpoint, they're consistent. So you're know, looking at the substantiality when, with the whole project and with the community, it's not, it, I would say it's not substantial because this is how the community was set up. Although it was, you know, somebody decided to draw a line there in 1920, it's actually fairly consistent with the rest of the immediate neighborhood. And um, so there wasn't, there wasn't an official plan, but it seems that there was some sort of a plan in, in place. Um, the area and the width that the area, I, again, I, I think because of the fact that the rest of the neighborhood is, is like this, there's no adverse um, physical or environmental impact on the neighborhood. And, um, and again, with the self-creation, this is something that was certainly created you know, many years ago and has existed like this, has existed to the public like this. Um, you know, Chairman Wolf made a point earlier that he believed, or some, not that he believed, that somebody had stated that the, the neighbors had relied on the merger of the, um, the two lots. And certainly the neighbors uh, who choose to speak will be speaking, but um, I don't know that that's, that that's accurate. I don't, I don't know that many people knew of the merger provision. And the fact that this was, um, that that was a possibility, but um, certainly from what I've heard around in speaking to people on, you know, on Pine, on, on Parsonage, that are here or not here, um, you know, this, it was always believed that this was a, a separate and, uh, individual lot. And I think having, you know, in conclusion, essentially, the, having a single family residential home in this neighborhood is consistent with the rest of the neighborhood where a barn is not. And, you know, to maximize the, the use of the property for the owner, is certainly something you know we we like to consider without any detriment to the community, and I do think that um, having a, a residential home here is is a better outcome than um, 
you know, something else that could be there. If it was, you know, if somebody were to have storage sheds on there and, and things like that, you know, if, if this, to, to somebody using that barn for storage and coming in and out and, and using it for its purpose that it is, I, I think that a single family residential home is certainly more consistent uh, and desirable with the neighborhood. Certainly there will be speak, people to speak to that. Okay, just to clarify um, your comment about what I said, that came from, I think, Stephanie at the planning board meeting. So if you what? want to what, 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 comment about the neighbors enjoying the merger clause or enjoying the benefits of the merger or being assured that the property was there because of the merger clause. It might have been from discussions that. from me, actually. I'd spoken to Sarah Garlin the next day. When I was over there to take pictures, she was coming out. And she had said she's always, always understood the lot to be unbuildable and that nothing could well, happen. This was this was this a comment correct? that yeah. came from the uh, yeah. This is from and the Mr. Group from the discussion. Sarah's husband from the as well. Yeah. It the, came from the video. Yeah. So yeah. If, if you want to address that during okay. the public hearing, just to address um, Luke's point, that's that was fine. Um, but I understand okay. you know you wouldn't be representing the planning board, right? Okay. Just so that Luke understands where sure. that's coming from. Yeah. No. I, I, as well. that's, sure. Um, all right, so if you're finished with the presentation, I think we can open open this up to board questions and then we'll move into public questions and comments after that. Um, so I'll, I'll start. I guess my, my first question is um, the, the desire to keep the building where it's located. Um, seems to force you to do something inconsistent with the neighborhood, which is to not have a front door facing Parsonage Street. So I'm, I'm wondering about the decision there and how that factors in, why you wouldn't have just pushed it back 10 feet and put the front do door there with the porch so it looks like all the other houses on the block. So every decision that we made up until our application was made under the assumption which you know, was an assumption that changing as little as possible would be the best outcome, both for the the lot, for the uh, neighborhood, for that building that I think is a beautiful building that you know you see coming over that hill and it sits beautifully there. It's sat there for almost a hundred years. I personally am a kind of a history buff, so I like that about it. And so we we went about it with the change as little as possible approach. And so had we not taken that approach, we certainly could have tried that, but that was the that was the strategy we, we took. Can I, can I ask a question? Where on the proposed ground floor plan is the front door? I don't it's next to the um, coffee table there, to the left of that coffee table in the middle, this? right there, yeah. So it's in the back corner? It's on the side corner. So this, the back of the side? There? Yep, that's the front door. That's the front door? Pine Street. Four feet wide? I believe so. It looks like a window to me. I mean, I, I'm not arguing, I'm just... Yeah, that's, it, it extends up to a window on the second floor. They're the same, they're the same width. It, but yeah, that's the, that's the front door. Yeah, In other words, the front door is here. Correct. On the side point. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. right. I have a question for sure. Luke. Um, sure. If you could clarify something in your presentation. Um, during the part where you were citing <clears throat> case law, mm -hmm. um, were you, in doing so, were you disputing the idea that the code required us to view the two lots, 21 Parsonage and the neighboring lot, as a, a single lot for zoning purposes? Yes. I, I think that that's a, um, in my opinion, that's an inaccurate statement. I think that the lots are separate lots. And for zoning purposes, this lot is non-conforming. So I, I'm not stating that um, because of the um, because of this provision that you know we, we shouldn't need an area variance, we shouldn't need a, a you know 
50 by 50 with that we should meet all of those things what, what I'm stating is that um, I don't believe that based on the language in this code they should be treated as one law I don't believe the code says they become one law I think the code says that they lose their non-conforming status um, if they were treated as one law I mean Due to that ownership, 36 Pine Street is also a non-conforming lot, and it has no pre-existing status as well. So that's, I mean, if you look at it on, on that way, and then there is, we can go down the, the whole of what the merger provision means to the, the, benefit, the built lot versus the non-built lot. But I don't believe that the language in this code is specific enough in stating that the lots are merged or that um, they should be treated as one, and that's why I was uh, kind of talking about those particular cases. But you acknowledge that your proposed lot is substandard and it needs variances yes. in order to build on. Yes. And that's yeah. We, we from the beginning we've right. we've agreed okay. with that. Okay. Yeah, um, so I understand the future plans, and. Having been on the board for a while, I understand also that life happens. And it could come to pass that you, for whatever reason, after you, you got your variances and after you renovated and wherever the house was going to be, you um, were forced to sell it. And you could. Your attorney would say, yeah, it's perfectly willing to sell it. The variance is run with the land. So what I see is a nice cottage. But I also see a target rich environment for variances, variance requests for the next 25 years from people coming in and saying, well, you know, uh, it's only one bedroom. I need another bedroom. And I've got a wife and she's out to here, you know, with a, you know, have a baby. And, um, you know, none of the closets. And, and this isn't what normal is in the village in terms of number of bedrooms. So, and I think that if I was living in the neighborhood, I would feel like that is a worrisome thing that will go on. That sign, this property is subject to a uh, variance proceeding in terms of ZBA, will be there for the next two decades. So what, what, what would you, how would you respond to that concern that we don't want to start off the neighborhood with knowing that life can happen and we're creating something which could be a wary you know what i'm saying it might be acceptable as a small cottage but as zb we're human beings you know sure. we don't want to say no sure. and you know you, you, over time the, you get this building creep and you get into a situation where ultimately you don't have something which fits the right how would you respond to that how would you tell us to well, I mean, I, I, think, I think my response to that would be, you know, up and down that street and around the corner and all the other streets, that's a, that's a real possibility with any house there. Um, that, you know, all of these houses are, are small. And as families grow and people think they need more space, sometimes they, that, that could be anywhere. You know, you, you have a lot of these small houses. So this particular one, I think it's distinguished from that in that we're not currently seeking, um, we're seeking the variances, but we're keeping what's there. We're not looking to increase it. We're, we're not looking to, if this were a, non a pre-existing non-conforming law, we're not looking to increase any of the non-conformity. We're looking to take what is there and continue with that, only make it into a single family home. I know we are pre-existing not conforming, so or, you know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know we are not conforming, not pre-existing, but that's the example. You know, we're not looking to increase any of these um, these not conformities and to make uh, even though if he put it in the middle and could do a larger house, that would you know that's a possibility. We're not looking to do any of that. We're this is a very specific um, and particular circumstance because there is the existing structure and it's. Uh, going off the existing structure. So I, I think, um, you know, you're not creating a precedent in that standpoint that this, the next homeowner here uh, could say, well, the variance has already been granted, so we should be able to, you know, come out another 20, 10 feet on this side or another five feet here. You know, we've already, um, that's already been done. And I, I think that from that standpoint, once the variances are granted, then they would be seeking to increase any nonconformity, and we certainly have. 
a lot of uh, ability that manage that. Let me follow up on that um, sure. question with a question to John. Um, Matt suggested at the planning board review that um, further development or changes of size or addition of an accessory structure could be limited by a site plan through the plan uh, on the site plan through the planning board. Is that the case? Uh, you, I mean, if you were to approve it, you can make a condition that it, it can't be further expanded. Um, you can make them file a restriction, like a deed restriction, that they can't um, expand the existing footprint any further. If you're worried about, you know, additional variances down the road to bump it out here or bump it out there. Um, we could do that? Yes. And could that also include um, the height of the building? They're only making one and a half stories, but they could go to two and a half. I mean, yes. if potentially if they were to get Yes, so I would do it as a deed restriction, so that way it's in the chain of title, and that way everybody knows the subsequent purchasers put on notice that there's severe limitations. Okay. Yeah. Somebody, I guess, down the road may try to lift those restrictions to bring some type of court action but, you know, i think as long as you're on notice and that's always the case though isn't it yes yes notice is the most important yes so in other words by deed restriction they would be um prevented from coming to the zva and asking well, for yeah I mean, you, <laughs> they're not prevented you can't prevent them it's a hard argument yeah. yeah that's the thing i mean i'm here to say that because of what you've been saying though. right i mean you can't really prevent them the subsequent purchaser from coming coming to the zva and, and asking for the variances but certainly if you have the recorded restrictions on record uh, it's a much easier no right because it's important yeah because you, you could say you knew. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a power report when they buy property. So. But you can't say you can never come back to the ZBA and request the marriage. Right. I mean, you could say it, but <laughs> it, that would be difficult to enforce. They have a procedural due process right. Um, I mean, they could agree to it, but the next person right. could probably challenge it. Right. Um, but that would run, it would run with the land, just as a variance would. Yeah, the variances the would run with the land, but if you put them, a lot of times if you buy a single family home, you're not going to look to see what variances, um, what planning board and ZBA approvals are on the property. So that's why I would suggest if you, would do, if you wanted to do restrictions, they should be like a recorded declaration in the chain of title, because that's what people will check the chain of title when they buy the home. They won't go to the clerk's office to see, oh, what are there any variances on this property? What's what's the site plan? You, you'll do it with a commercial property, but, or you should do it with a commercial property, but um, people don't do that for residential homes. I don't want to monopolize, but I've got another question. And the last thing, can I ask oh, sure. real quick, would that be more of a planning issue to throw something on that, or it'd be just as much of a ZBA? So that would be, you guys are making the determination okay. or decisions so of you set whatever right. conditions are reasonably related to, to, if, if, to what you're approving, if, if you decide to approve it, that's a big if. Um, so it, it would be part of your condition of approval, if, if you go there. Did you have another question? Yeah, I want to um, I want to hear about the parking space a little more. I think that, um, I mean, from my perspective, if I were at 36, I would rather have you parking in the street than having a, a, a car in the uh, in the yard. And I know that the um, you're trying to reduce the variances by having a, a spot in the yard, but I wonder if, if that, um, I mean, did you talk to the neighbors about that? What, what's the thought of that? Would they rather, if they have to have this, would they rather not hear that? And we can hear from, Hear from them also um, soon. Yeah, I, I, I mean, since, since the owner of 36 is here, I, I would I would rather turn that over to him. Um, the initial thought with um, with this process when when we met at, at the first uh, workshop was to not have a parking spot there um, because of the proximity to 36, um, and that's you know that is a consideration. But there was a lot of uh, when we met with the planning board as well, there was a lot of talk about parking 
um, throughout the village, and I'm you know, very aware of that. The times I've driven up and down that street, it doesn't seem, you know, that it's not an overwhelming parking situation. Um, I haven't done any sort of, you know, official review, but um, in the winter, that's obviously a concern to, that there is no street parking. So um, to have one, ultimately to have one on the property would be a benefit, I think, you know, whether it's used regularly or not is, is a different story. But certainly, you know. And indirectly, with regards to variances, and particularly uh, front yard variance, uh, the front of the house currently, are, would there be windows? Uh, I'm, I've looked at some of your diagrams. I'm not sure what the complete plan is. Is, is for a staircase to run along the front part, portion of the house in, internally, mm -hmm. uh, the internal staircase? And are there those vertical windows on either side of it? Mm -hmm. All right. Just so it doesn't, if it were to be left very close to the sidewalk, it, you know, that it wouldn't be just a side wall to a house. And, I mean, I'm just thinking about the character and think about the character in the neighborhood or, you know, allowing a building to be so close to the, the aesthetic sort of comes in a little bit. Um, uh, absolutely. Even though in the end it's an HDRB, uh, but it does factor in, I think, a little bit with uh, variance. I, you know, I, I agree with you. I think, I, I think that's a lot of, I mean, from my standpoint, that's um, a lot of what's important here is the aesthetic of the community. It's a lot of what we're considering, and that's, that's what zoning is, is all about, right? It's to create a uniform plan for the community so that um, it, it looks a certain way, it acts a certain way, and uh, I do think that, that this is consistent with that. And, and your point of having a bare you know, the bare side certainly wouldn't be uh, consistent with So this is the front elevation? That's the Fabian Street? Correct, yes. All right, and so the stair, these are the side windows? Mm -hmm. They're in there? Correct. And then uh, the stair is running up, I guess, this way? Correct. All right. What What is this? Um, Those are the shutters that close to... Um, make the front of the building look like it looks now. It's privacy and aesthetic. So you can close those shutters so that you have an entirely vertical slatted front of house, which is what is there currently. It's a, it was, a, again, to our initial approach, we wanted to make as little changes as possible. Um, so, so in other words, the red that's the is support. the shutter? No, that's and a, the hinges? Can I draw? Yes. Do you mind if I? Yeah, yeah, draw. Yeah. The, the shutter would go like that. This is just a support. Oh, full, full. Yeah. Two. Is the shutter interior or and they're exterior? Hinged. Exterior. Okay. And they're hinged, and so you just close it over like that. Okay, I see. And there's one on each side. So basically, uh, from the first floor to the second floor, it sort of close over the window area. One large on each yes. side. So when would you have these shutters closed? It'd be the discretion of whoever's inside the house. So if they okay. felt like they have privacy, I mean, they, you know, small cracks in between the slats that let light in, you know, but if they want okay. their privacy. How difficult them. is it to really move? Just out of curiosity. My architect tells me it's simple, but okay. <laughs> I have to make sure the builder follows the. The, the shutters are on the outside. Mm -hmm. So to shut them, you can come outside and shut them and go back. Okay. 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 Um, when did you buy the property? Uh, last summer. Last. Okay. So, so if there's a skunk or an animal problem there, then it's already your responsibility, right? So you're you're working on that since you brought it up. Always. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, mitigating some so mitigating cool. some weed trees as well. Yeah. yeah. Some what? Some some weed trees. trees yeah. Okay. Some weed trees your house. There's some trees that have taken over the property. That need to come okay. down. Maybe you could come and take care of the skunk that's under my front porch. <laughs> um, I just question? had a quick question sure. about the site plan. Um, I just want to make sure I understand what's happening on the periphery of the property. There's, it looks like there's a patio that's coming onto your property. If I'm not reading it correctly, there's like a, on the property line, there's like a patio and a garden across the property line. I don't have a site plan with the parking space on. Does it? Does mm -hmm. that? 
Let me get you one. Overlap what you have, or is that remain? No, the so the patio encroaches. Um, I don't even know it about a foot maybe, but the um, the parking spot comes in six feet from there. Okay. So. Oh. Okay, so it remains in this. In this yes, that, that that remains. It's actually a um, a stone wall of neighbors, um, and it's part of their their. The stone wall there. and this patio are part of the neighbors. The right. The stone wall here. The stone wall here. That's correct. And then this is a patio that's coming. That patio? No, that's uh, part. Of, that's just the parking. There is a little um, area that comes over there, but it's um, there's not a full patio that comes out like that. Okay. Okay. And the wall there is really only about a foot and a half high. Is that right? And it's only in the front part of the. Um, any other questions from the board? We can, of course, always ask more questions in the future. Um, but I'd like to give the public a chance to uh, to talk before we move on. Anything else? No. Would the public like to come up and, and take a look before we jump in, or We've just jump right it. in? All right. So um, please come up one at a time. State your name and look at Michael over there in the camera. <laughs> you, can you, for, we can go. you can sit down for now. Yeah, yeah. Be by the, uh, with the Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being on this board because this is an, an easy, uh, easy ask here uh, tonight. I know it's a complicated one. Um, I have a number of questions and, and concerns. Um, yeah, one, I was wondering if Luke, if you could, could you uh, reread the merger clause or provision, whatever that was in there? Sure. It was just one word on there that I was looking short. Uh, a lot in any district that was under separate ownership from all adjoining, adjoining lots on the effective date of this chapter, in which has a total lot area, lot width, or lot depth less than otherwise required herein may be used and developed in conformity with all of their applicable regulations in its district subject to grant of site approval. Was there some, I thought there was something about the, the uh, original owner or being different owners. Uh, it just says a lot in any district that was under separate ownership. That was under from all separate. adjoining from all, all adjoining lots lot on the effective date. So this okay. one was under the same ownership. Does Correct. that have any? Correct. So they they're not entitled to these protections or these grant this, the grandfather protections. Right. They're not entitled to it because they. Um, same their owner. lot is owned by the same person right. that owned an adjoining lot. Right. But the merger, the word merger, uh, I, is there another word that's used in these? Uh, that, uh, I mean, what's the word that's used in the, you know, in the legal, you know, words here? What's what's on there? Does it say? Is there no, a, it doesn't. It, and again, it's, it's probably my fault for. Uh, so the, you're the only one that used that word to start. Only this the whole attorneys, thing. yes. Okay. The attorneys right. use this word. I thought clause. there might have been a clause or something in the law that actually said the word merger. No, no. A lot of times, if you search a lot of codes, some codes, a lot of codes have a provision just like this, where they address substandard lots, pre-existing substandard lots, where the ownership. Um, of adjoining lots are by the same person. Sometimes, every once in a while, you, you will see a merger, you know, they'll throw the word, the M word in there. Um, a lot of times they don't, so I apologize for that. I, 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 I thought that, there was, that you were just saying that merger really didn't mean it. I, I'm clear, no need to further yeah. explain. Uh, I, I just, this is in no particular order, I kind of ran out of uh, space here and jumped up top. Uh, one is John Martin's point on the uh, distance of the sidewalk. I think that is a concern. I think it should be something you guys should look at, and I think it is serious. I, it's not, you know, that the neighborhood. It's not like most neighborhoods around. Maybe Main Street might be different, Luke's house, for example. Um, but, yeah, but like in, the, in these areas, there aren't houses built right on the sidewalk like this one will be. So I, I think that should be concerned, and I don't think it's, you know, any small part. Um, I was wondering how many number of houses, when Luke's talking about, I uh, hope you don't mind me calling you Luke. No. I've known Luke for quite a while. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so calling him Mr. actually, I feel, uh, no, I don't yeah. know. Um, anyway, uh, no disrespect. Uh, 
The number of the houses, I mean, we're talking about how this would fit in and the number of houses and comparing to other houses, but uh, I was wondering, in this situation, we have a house that's been there, or two pieces of property that have been there for a long time, and the back, the backyard is in the back door, and usually where you're looking out, if you're in a house, is actually, is a little bit unusual because you're looking at someone's side yard and you're going to be looking at someone's building. So I think there is a difference there when you're comparing other lots. There might be a lot that have short, smaller side lots, might be a few feet, maybe three feet, not conforming, whatever. But in this situation, the person that owns that property will now be looking at a residence. I mean, if the barn stays exactly the same, maybe that it doesn't matter, but I think that should be considered that, you know, it is unlike a lot of the other lots because of the, the situation from backyard facing side lot. Um, uh, the other one, uh, another uh, thing John, John had said, uh, you could uh, conditionally approve this. With that also, could you include um, that it would not be able to be used as an Airbnb and that it could only be used as a residence? One of the concerns that I've heard a number of times is that, you know, first this was going to be a, a nice little house for, the, for, you know, the applicant and then their in-laws and now you know, and there's concerns that it might go beyond that, or if someone else buys the house, as someone suggested, in another year or two, that, you know, it is an Airbnb, and that's a concern. It's not supposed to be an Airbnb because of our laws right now, but right. there are people that have Airbnbs, and maybe, you know, I think that's a concern. So can there be a restriction on that, or, you know, uh, conditioned on that? It could be drafted such that when other people have Airbnbs, uh, I would imagine there's usually a primary residence there and there might be an, an offshoot room or something. But in this case, you'd be distinguishing it by saying the person who's coming in there would be just using the entire premises. Right. And, you know, it'd be, that'd be one way of definitely precluding it. I don't know the full law here, you know, in Cold Spring on the Airbnbs, but we would look at that. But I think there are other Airbnbs in town that are just the total, the whole, the total residents or people move yeah. out. So it's just, not just an uh, accessory apartment or something that's being used. Yeah. Does the village have specific regulations on a, Airbnb? A permit is required for an Airbnb in the Arlen District. Nobody has one as far as I know. The, uh, the proposed code change is going to um, eliminate Airbnbs, I think, for... Um, for non-residential homes, but make it easier for you if it is the, your primary residence. And the other thing is the permit would only last for a year, I believe, right? It would have to be reapplied for a year. I don't year. I mean, I don't know, because nobody's ever gotten one, so. <laughs> <laughs> But the question is, can it be a restriction this month? Yeah, yeah. Can, well, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's you, the point you're making. You could, I, I guess my concern is, would the next owner try to challenge that restriction as some type of as, as unconstitutional, I, I don't know, but I mean, it sounds like they would, they would agree to it. Um, I, I guess I would have to do a little more research as well. Would that be another item that could potentially run with the land that has to be put on a deed and recorded? Yes, that would help, but again, somebody could try to lift that restriction. <coughs> well, they could always try anything. Right? Yes. Okay, just asking, I think if it can be and it gets down, gets to that point, I think that should be a consideration. For the um, one kind of disturbing thing is when we talk about historic fabric to me, um, and being a contractor for 40 years, um, you know, I look at that barn and it has historical significance, I guess. It, it's, it is just a barn. We've had said how wonderful it is, how it's setting, the setting is something that attracted it to you, that, you know, that was attractive to you and you'd like to keep it that way. But, you know, from a, from a contractor standpoint, um, I don't understand how, I mean, I don't see that thing being saved. I, I, I don't see how you're lifting something that doesn't have a foundation now or floor joists or whatever to keep that structurally sound enough to move so you could put a, a, a foundation under it. So when we're talking about the historic fabric, I'm not sure what historic fabric is actually going to be left of that and why we should even you know, be talking about historic fabric when it's actually going to be, in my opinion, I think that it'll turn out to be a, a, a new building pretty much. I mean, it might resemble that one. It might be the same shape. but. You know, as far as historic goes, you know, I don't, you know, I'd question, <laughs> I'd question that. Well, the, the HDRB might, if it got to the HDRB, they might say, you have to reuse this wood somehow. I think that's, but that's not on the zoning board. Right. Uh, just wanted to bring that up. Um, one thing I just wanted to clarify for, for everyone is I'm, the owners were aware of it when they purchased this, that this was not an easy piece of property. 
I mean, is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, uh, so it was a challenge. <laughs> absolutely. Before um, before we entered into or before Sam entered into contract, we did go and uh, meet with Greg Warner, uh, talk about what was uh, needed. Um, there was a highway department, was it, or um, talked about to the water department as well. You may have actually walked in while we were we were talking because there was some meeting going on right after. That's why everybody happened to be there. Um, and we did understand that it would be a, uh, a challenge. Um, and that it was denied at one point by the building inspector? It was denied It was denied at one point by the building inspector, but again, that was anticipated that variances would right. be needed here. So um, I just wanted to know if you understood that. I, we did understand that, okay. but it had never been uh, denied by a board. Right, OK. Um, I guess my last my last comment is uh, you know I understand you know you know the owner's rights and I think that's very important. I also you know you know being a resident also the mayor of the village um, I think it's important you know why codes were established and and the reason why codes were established were basically to prevent exactly what this application is for. Uh, the ZBA on the other hand was was formed and created to uh, to find relief in in, in, in instances like this, um, but. This seems to be like a bridge too far. It seems to be not one variance. We're not asking for one variance. We're asking for several variants, well, seven variants, six or seven variances, you know, including lot size, setbacks, parking. So we're basically asking to just kind of like, you know, to just put the zone, the code aside, you know, and, and the reason for the formation of the code, in my opinion. I think the code was set up to, 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 to make lots more, you know, more livable in this day and age, that they weren't going to be very small, they weren't going to keep be close together, regardless of, of the village, because if they took all that into consideration when they were making the code, um, they wouldn't have created the code the way it is. Because, all you, like you stated, there are a lot of properties that have small lots. I live on a very small lot or whatever, but I think the reason for the codes were to prevent that from happening. And, and in this case, not just one, but several, uh, you know, codes were asking to, you know, to put variances on and uh, you know and that's concerning to me because I really don't understand why we would have a ZBA after this and if this is all approved because no matter what property they had they could basically ask for anything and use this as a precedent and why wouldn't you be able to build on it and why why do we have codes and why do we have people up there enforcing it right and the code was recognizing the issue of due process where there were two separate owners of a small lot when it came into effect and therefore it said they would be somewhat accepted, whereas the term merger has been coming up. But the, no, the notion is, is if they were still a single owner at the right. time it came to effect, that it would be a lot more complicated. It would be viewed as a single lot in, 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 in some way. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, they're two separate lots, technically, but the code looks at it differently, whether separate owners owned it or a single owner owned it, and then subsequently transferred it. Um, John, I want to um, address that question of the uh, Dave Morandi, who did not announce his name before the camera, said that there might be a precedent um, if we grant these variances.